user. They don't spend much face-to-face -face time with Facebook. So we wanted to see, um, try to do solve this problem, but they're pretty expensive, so I'm going to you can do it. Um, can we use transcription to record a whole uh, checkup and then automate any of those kind of tasks? So let's give it a try over here. Um, I didn't have time to build speaker narration and classify speech as patient or pa physician, so I'll just be simulating the patient and I'll be talking and talk. Um, so, there we go. Uh, patient says, I've been having migraines, they seem to be getting worse. So the agent detected that they mentioned a condition or a symptom, and now it's trying to use the patient's history to reason with why they could be having migraines. Um, and then the physician can say, uh, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Have you noticed any triggers or patterns? Uh, so now it recognizes that the doctor is asking for more information, and it just summarizes whatever has been discussed on the plate in case doctor forgot what they said earlier. Uh, all right, next. Uh, patient gives more information. Um, it sounds like we need to refer you to a specialist, Dr. Smith. She's a neurologist who specializes in migraines. So it detects uh, that the doctor has made a referral, and now it also generates, I don't know why two emails, but generates an email that could be sent introducing the patient to the new doctor. And definitely hallucinated the email address over there. It's not sure, but it could be hooked up to the database. Um, and then, yeah, patient can say whatever, anything that can move the pain. Um, so I'm going to try one more um, task. I'm going to say, um, yes, I will give you a prescription for sumatriptan. You can pick it up at a pharmacy. So it's now finding nearby pharmacies. Uh, and then it also, uh, we could hook it up to a pharmacy backend, but now it just generates another email. Um, it, did not get the spelling correctly, so you can also edit the email over here. And if you send, we actually hook it up with resend, so uh, you actually send it to the email. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, up next we have Syntopica. Syntopica. Um, and on deck we have Book Graph. Notion Docs or Google or whatever, and um, it customizes the web for you. It's for when you go on a page and there's lots of text and you, you're like, I am trying to read all that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here we're up on a generic page and we run the Simplica Chrome extension. And what it'll do is it'll figure out what pages from your Notion are the most relevant for you and then link you back to them. So the whole web is already directly embedded with your existing information store. Uh, we support 10 plus integrations. Thank you, Psychic.dev. And uh, yeah, it gives you citations, look back at notes, and references to your data. Thanks. Up next we have book graph, and then following that we have campaign. Any contents. 
and we will uh, and uh, we will take uh, so in do this way take notes and we will take highlights and comments from the book to read or any content you consume, including podcast. And today we're going to present one of the types of project we're working on the food graph, how you connect all of those content together to help you uh, help you connect the dot or from different content. You will have you find the sporting evidence you have across your uh, cro cross your highlights and also contradictory we find in your uh, uh, in your highlights. In this way you understand your content a bit more. And then I'll hand over to Tom to talk about how we have technology, tech backend technology to empower this. Okay, so, so for the backend, we are using the, uh, we ingest our data like a book into the vector database and uh, use the simulator search to get uh, the relationships between different topics and different highlights. And we are also using the open eye and the prompts to identify different types of the relationship, like the contradictory. Uh, then we pass that the knowledge graph data uh, into our content. So the result is basically a fairly simple browser that allows us to take all of the highlighted topics and then look at the different relationships from that topic to other topics. So this particular topic can be expanded on in you know, different topics here, or it could be refined. Um, and basically you can navigate through the book basic, basing um, reading one topic and then finding different relationships, which makes it much easier to learn stuff by looking how things are based on each other. We also did work on some simple mermaid graphs, but uh, they didn't make it into the final product in time. Um, maybe we'll do Cytoscape or something a little bit more interesting eventually. Um, but this was a really interesting area, like um, not just links between topics, um, classifying the, the, the types of links. So it's kind of like a, a meta ontology, not just to the topics, but the, uh, relationships between topics. Um, in the first pass, we went through and found all those links, and then we found the categories for those links, and then we researched for links in those categories using uh, our links. So that's just a brief demo. That's it. Awesome. Good question. Claim one supports claim two, claim one contradicts claim two. Like, is that a known ontology or did you come up with that? And are those like zero shot classifiers or generative models or are they trained classifiers? Yeah, we have a product, uh, we have a product in place to use uh, uh, For today, we use prompt to help us identify if the contradictory or support evidence. And then, um, and then we will just visualize on the, uh, uh, visualize on the website. Is that, is that what you asked? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. really the and then you just came up with the classes. So contradiction is just your idea. Supports is just your idea. We, we ran through a bunch of um, relationships and then um, used the LLM to classify those relationships. And then we reduced the number so that we had a set number of relationships. And then we looked again for relationships using that set of classes, basically. Uh, if we did a different book, it might have been a different set of classes. But eventually, we come up with an uh, overarching ontology for everything. Jeremy's did this already. Next up, we have campaign. And then following them, we've got near me. Congress, 
and it was very hard. You have to raise a lot of money. You have to raise millions of dollars. I had a very large campaign team over 200 people, and these people are coming LinkedIn. They're going through the voter database. They're going through the Federal Election Commission website and trying to figure out who are their good donors, trying to get them to um, respond to our email, trying to understand the issues that they're facing. And it's just incredibly time consuming and not very personalized or very effective. The market for this is huge. Um, there's about a $20 billion market for our political donations. And um, campaign, our team, is able to unlock the smaller donors. Most of the donors right now are bigger donors because they're the only ones that they have are efficient. Campaign managers and employment consultants take about 10% of the donations. So it's a big chunk. So if you do 10% of 20 billion, that's a $2 billion revenue. And there's still about 1.5 million US nonprofits that aren't being well serviced. So what is our what is our AI agent powered funding pipeline look like? So what we have is we have campaign, which is essentially a chatbot using text, emails, um, website chat to talk to donors. Um, this is a bit of an eye chart, so I'm going to kind of talk about it briefly. But the first part of it is trying to get the first introduction to the potential donor. So looking at um, looking at the uh, voter database, the FSC website, putting it through the venture database, um, you know, using the query engine, and then once we actually have interest in the from the donor, we move to a discovery stage where we try to understand what issues do that does that um, donor have, and then addressing the problem through looking at the candidate website, vectorizing it, and then sending an email to um, make sure that they understand that we, we can solve their problem, and then they ask for the donation itself. So I want to pass it over to uh, my colleague here for the actual demo. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sambhava. Thanks Greg for um, showing us how it all works. I will give a quick demo. Again, this is six of us got together a couple of hours back. Uh, figured we should all work on this together. Um, so the way this works is, as Greg said, you have a voter database which has a bunch of things like your name, your address, uh, maybe some uh, details about your phone number, um, some details about did you vote last year, when was the last time you voted, who are the people you donated to, all of that stuff. So we capture all of that data. We also look at your social presence, maybe your LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook and try to figure out what are the causes you really care about. We get all of that, put them in a vector TV. So this is uh, some code <laughs> showing how we did all of that, we put all the stuff there. Now what the candidate can do here is ask very targeted questions. So they can ask, hey, um, this is a zip code where um, a lot of my donations came from last time, I want to get all the people from the zip code. Uh, for this example, we just uh, so who are the people who work for uh, Wing Venture Capital um, and just extract their uh, profiles for us. And as you can see, we got Jake and Rajiv uh, got some causes that they care about. So it looks like Jake cares about education, dev tools, uh, Rajiv cares about security in the tech sector. Uh, so we got all of that data. Now next. What we next did is the candidates have their own website about what causes they care about. So we get all of that, combine both the data sources, and then finally uh, we try to personalize the emails. Um, so this is very similar to how a sales process looks like. So you first identify who are the people you're going to send out to, have an introductory email, then move to discovery stage, you qualify the people, and then finally you ask for a donation, which is the ask. Um, so again, this is showing how some prompts about all of those emails, starting from us to discovery, and then finally um, the asking, uh, sorry, the intro, the discovery, and then the ask emails. Um, so then we are using Langchain agents to actually uh, get all of that data and then put it in Gmail for us to review all the emails. And as you can see here, this is an example of an intro email. It says, hi, Jake. It's a progressive candidate for mayor. This is Greg speaking. So looks like you care about these uh, causes. I care about them a lot. Um, and kind of showing how you can really personalize these emails for them. Yeah, that's what we do. Uh, any questions? Jimmy. 
from the server office. Yeah, it has the email ID. The well, you're asking about the legal. Uh, as the other quality. Oh, the quality. Um, so um, the plan is to actually have Human Loop review it. So we have the campaign also has lots of volunteers. Now the campaign, if the volunteers actually have to draft the emails, it's a lot of time. It could be 10x, 100x of time. If the volunteers have to review the emails, it's not so bad. So that's kind of like one QA check that we do is just have someone review it before it's in draft before it's actually sent. Good question. All right, amazing. Thank you so much. All right, up next we have up next we have Nirvi, a leisure agent, and then after that we have Lumos. Okay. One, one, last uh, one last question. Um, so, if you're an entrepreneur raising money from venture capitalists and angel investors, like how much do we get to modify your software to make it functional? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, you were asking what again? How much do you get to modify your software to make it work for entrepreneurs that are raising money from? Um, so it's a, um, I think, I think for raising venture capital, um, it's a much higher dollar value. So it's, um, it's probably tougher because you probably can do it by email or text uh, because you know, nobody's going to give you money over email or text. But donations, donations can be $10, it could be $1, it could be $50. And people do that over text. Low dollar amounts, you could do that autonomously using the agents. But it's hard to do that for real startups just because the dollars are going to be too big. That's a good question. Um, if you are interested in the other cause you talked about, we can chat more. Uh, hi, I'm Dylan, and this is David, and uh, this is near me. Uh, basically, we designed this autonomous agent with a friend of mine. Uh, she travels a lot, but she doesn't really like to have a pinned itinerary. So the idea is that the moment you open the app, it will take uh, your location data and uh, time data, and it will automatically generate the list of things for you to do, activities to do, in a, possibly in a place that you've never been before. Uh, and it will do it automatically without uh, any user input at all, so. Yeah, so basically you open the app, and we pull up uh, all the nearby locations from the Google Maps API, and then we build an agent that will go through all of these uh, these locations that we found, and then we query it to ask, like, based on this time, this uh, weather condition, is this potentially interesting? And then we're returning uh, the top five hits. And we also ask the uh, API to come up with your with a uh, fun description. So I'm gonna do something a little bit risky, but I want to show that it works. So I loaded new location data, but I hope the internet uh, is working. Maybe not. Uh, let's see the error messages. <laughs> okay. Let's still look. Oh, 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 oh. So, that's pretty good. <laughs> that, that's really, yeah. Yeah, you can call. Next up, we have Lumos, and on deck, we'll have Relay.
Okay, so we're almost through business. And no, no one did that. Tell me what you did. Hello everyone, uh, we are Relay. Uh, so our team decided to uh, take a little bit of a different approach to instead of using single agents for a problem that we wanted to solve, we wanted to actually take a, a bunch of agents uh, and throw them at a, a, a set of tasks simultaneously. So we were really inspired by uh, this paper that came out a couple of months ago uh, that focused on multi-agent collaboration in an environment with some constraints. We wanted to try to replicate uh, the same paper but within a more tangible solution space that we're all pretty familiar with. So we selected uh, product development, uh, specifically through Agile, to try to replicate an agent that would behave as a PM, a software architect, and a software engineer. And uh, on top of that, having an Oracle that would actually assign different tasks, delegate, check bandwidth, that sort of thing. Now, at the high level, before we get into the demo, uh, for any of you that work with PMs, you know that a lot of what we can do can be elevated. Uh, that has been done here. Uh, so basically taking in Use the feedback with some problem statement, converting that into a framework like jobs are done, and then ultimately spinning that out into uh, feature recommendations that are specific enough, but not too specific, that engineers can actually work with. Uh, from there, the architect will go ahead and generate diagrams and file structures that uh, will provide scaffolding for the engineers to do their work. Well, this is all through LLMs, by the way, both the previous one and from here, but the UML diagram is uh, generated via LLMs and plant UML. And then finally, for the software engineer, it's basically just a code generation exercise within the constraints that we're provided for. There are things we want to get to, but I think it's better if we just show you what we've done. having a PM in the loop or UX researchers in the loop as well to 
uh, the enhanced feedback that you're actually getting provides some variations on the recommended features. It helps to uh, ensure that it's not garbage in, garbage out. Uh, same goes for shadowing the behavior of uh, other engineers or architects on the job uh, to observe the decision that they make and try to replicate that. Okay. But yeah, I can imagine a pretty crazy launch where every user can reprogram the code base and thousands of people build the app together in this like language collaborative. Uh, that's that's the smartest apps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've never heard that idea before. Crazy. <laughs> Awesome. Is Lumos ready? Lumos? One minute? Okay. All right. In the meantime, we're going to go to Moonshot Stock. Moonshot Stock, you guys in the house? All right. Come on up. We're going to have some competing stock traders.
since the screen of the three uh, predictions uh, so that I like, people can subscribe to and uh, make the trade. Uh, but regardless if they are more interested, uh, they can use the automatic box for the trading. Uh, yeah. Um, and with all this information together, I think someone 
um, can really use this to supercharge their ability to um, plan out their business, to pick better providers and better people that will actually sell them the things they want. Because as a business owner, you do not have the time to go through and find exactly what the best deal is for the thing that you're selling or buying or, or integrating into your product. Um, yeah, so if we have a few seconds here, I'm curious if anyone in the audience wants to throw out another thing. I'm sure it'll pop out something that I'm using a random or, or complete garbage, but. Uh, socks. Socks, okay. Socks. Okay, so it's going through it. So it's checking out um, specifically women's socks, it seems, but um, popping out price, and there you go. And so single product um, at like the vendor level is like $1.50 for your socks. Um, so an interesting fact it is. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All righty, thank you. Up next, we have um, Mr. Beast Bot. And then on deck, we've got Enhanced Tree of Thought, Reasoning Agent.
Check your phones. Let's get that first one. So yeah, so it kind of starts out 
brainstorming, criticizing. Uh, I got some, got some really good prompts here. Um, and then, so yeah, just, just kind of through this in uh, a kind of lane chain framework to define the personas uh, up here at the beginning. Uh, inserting a question such as how could the exploration and potential colonization of Mars change the course of human history? So something that's kind of open-ended um, and a little bit complex. And that's, re that's really where like reasoning frameworks uh, come in handy. Uh, so, so yeah, just kind of starting off um, with, with a lane chain prompt template, adding in the personas, the question, going through all that, prompt one, prompt two, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is all in the, in the spreadsheet there if you want to kind of see what the, the prompts are. Because the, the, they're, actually, they're actually pretty good. Um, <laughs> it helps clarify my own thinking as I go through this and as I kind of go through each, each um, uh, uh, answer. And then here's a kind of, kind of a reflection stage at the very end, uh, which is really helpful to kind of figure out what, what just happened there. Um, and, and including things like, I just tried this. Uh, oh, well, so this here's all the answers, but you know, go through all that. Um, after going through it, I asked, okay, like, what, would, what, what would a better question look like? So that's kind of cool. So then I just re, kind of re thought the question uh, from different, and kind of added in um, you know, different trade-offs and things like that, um, and kind of did it again. All right, now, now that's the new question. <laughs> um, and then go through the same kind of prompt sequence. Um, so anyway, this just kind of goes on and on and on. And then you kind of do that and then, and then kind of chain all the prompts together like that to kind of get a final answer or perspective and all that. Um, so anyway, I kind of ran out of time, but, but the, the, the goal here was basically to create an agent that um, you, you put a question and then it can determine what personas would be most helpful to answer that question and then, and then actually generate the definition of those personas and then run through this sort of tree of thoughts, uh, kind of rhythm, reasoning rhythm, and then give you a kind of final, final answer. Um, so that's kind of the next stages there. So, so yeah, that's kind of a deep reasoning uh, thought, essentially. Um, so yeah, it's all on, uh, on, on GitHub here. So yeah, thanks. Excellent question. Um, do you find that it converges? And if so, when? Um, well, but the conversion is going to tell it to, which is, which is, which is here. So, um, so there's, it's a kind of two-phase conversion process, right? Individual convergence, right? After I've gotten all your like criticism and feedback, what's my final answer? Um, and then it's pretty good at that. It's, it's very actually, it gives really, really, really surprisingly good answers. Uh, once you kind of come to be thoughtful and give it the feedback, for some reason, it's able to keep, keep track of all that pretty, pretty well. Um, so it converts well at the end, at the individual level. Uh, and then once we have all those kind of final answers, then that kind of um, that kind of final citizen stage across all the experts uh, is is has always worked well, right? And there's always been like some learning going on with it um, around kind of the conversion properties have been uh, and things like that. So so yeah, I think that the converts actually happens really really well. How many how many loops? Um, two. I started with two, like three personas and two and two feedback loops of of criticism and evaluation. And then the retrospective at the end, um, you can branch that all kinds of ways. You can have, then you can generate three more ideas that can branch from the final answer there and kind of start things there. So you can kind of loop it and, and nest reasoning structures, which is really, really cool. That's cool. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got domain awesome. agents, and then after that, we've got create your own food, which is data set for AI. And one thing that we played around with was creating this in a way that would be multimodal. 
So we'll demo both the text and uh, the audio, and this will be a quick little demo. All right, we're looking for ideas for a business. Taxidermy. Taxidermy. Tour. Taxidermy. Or dash for socks. For what? The socks. Okay, we're going to do taxidermy for socks here. We'll see if this works. Taxidermy for socks. Is the server running? Is the server running? That's the second question. <laughs> you put the servers. Chainlink 
to create a, like a front end automatically, so that uh, like uh, we do not even need to serve the model or automatic have a front end. And uh, yeah, essentially we have the like a iPath notebook as the uh, like an agent that uh, automatically generate the code, run run the whole thing, and uh, yeah, like a create the data pairs. And the next step is just like a for you to take your favorite uh, small, large base model and fine tune your data set. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. All right, thank you. Next up, we've got SyncMeet. And then on deck, we have Form Blaster. Two of the evening. Harvard, 
amazing talk, by the way. Uh, I think we're solving quite a similar problem because you also kind of try to get to people and then align that and have something more tailored. Um, then we have Robert. Robert is a business executive. Um, then we have Alex, social entrepreneur. And we have Jackson, okay, a philosopher uh, with PhD from Oxford University. So, but we go deeper, we have the personalities aspect, we have the aspirations aspect, we have the beliefs. Funny enough, at some point probably we will reach the, the context window limit because Ron just believes that AI should be used. I mean, that's a strong belief, I guess. That's why we're all here. Uh, so, Ron, what's Ron? Do we have one here? Okay, it's not bad. He's believing in, in using AI, I guess. So yeah, and then from there we get the summary with the final answer. And then we essentially have the disaggregated together, and this is something that we can use to, to talk to these people. So in the background, we have also connected to the uh, agents in Slack, because every time that we want to talk to these people, we can also just use Slack. And the ultimate vision that we were trying to, to pursue behind this development is just to have this supercharged communication with people, because every day, so much stuff is happening, we all have this fear of missing out, we all have this, this idea that, damn, this, this guy is probably cool, but I didn't have a chance of talking with him. So this is a really good uh, uh, autonomous agent that exists in the background that gets all different connections uh, from all different sources, be it something private from your company, whatever uh, Slack channel, or something public like LinkedIn, and then from there you have the whole thing wrapped together and presented to you in a five minute brief. I guess that's it. Thank you so much. I would be happy if you have some questions. Any questions? The idea was so straightforward that everyone was just fine. Love it. I guess we still have one team, right? Yes, we have one more. Form Blaster. You all here? Amazing. All right. Last team of the evening. Let's go. Woo! Go. Submit 
it's going to prompt me to give just data about my company and it's going to use that in order to take the questions and fill the answers. I'm surprised that no one else had done this, even um, multi-on, I was hoping could grab it. And I think, you know, someone from Lumos mentioned earlier on the note of, will a large model take over the space? The thought is no. I kind of have a different take. I think that a large model did take over the prefrontal cortex space of, uh, you know, the brain. This is the language model, and I think one will as well in the muscle cortex region. I think that's super exciting that we're all working in that space. So what this is doing is I used agents in order to build my hackathon project last night. This is a Loom video I made when I said, here's what I want to create. And then I created an automation which goes and sends on a recruiting platform to a ton of humans. It's a human powered AGI of sorts. And I said, if you create this, I'll then offer you a job. And the reason I'm at this stage of wanting to go out and go fundraise is I used the same exact scenario to initially get to this state. I wish I could show on the main laptop here, but uh, what this is is a few people three months ago when I sent out an assignment had seen that assignment and then went to a hackathon led by Warp Speed and they said, why don't we build this assignment for the hackathon? And they ended up winning a prize from Redlit. So we onboarded them to the team. Uh, that initial assignment was taking exactly what Adept AI had demoed in order to raise $350 million and creating it and making it fully automated the same. So we brought them onto the team, improved that over time, and then got to this stage where I went and did the same exact thing of auto-inviting, and building a human agent system in order to build a platform uh, that automates it. So, sorry I couldn't show the exact demo here, but uh, what we can see here is that it's been filling out this accelerator form, taking just a little bit of data that I had filled, and then automating it. And so, now you can just go upload a link and list of incubators or accelerators or firms that you want to apply to, and automatically get it done. Thank you guys. Alrighty. And that concludes the demo presentations. Thank you all so much for presenting. Uh, it takes a lot to get up there on stage and show the world what you've created. Yes. Yes, add your GitHub code, please. The judges are going to deliberate uh, for a little bit. And we will be back in, I don't know. We'll be back in about 10 minutes um, for the closing of the seminar. Oh, cool. All right, we have one more demo, actually, guys. Hold up, hold up, we have one more demo. This is called Planner Agent.
Um, hey guys, so uh, Lama 2 came out a few days ago, which is a very exciting development, especially for the open source development. Uh, and there's a lot to do on top of Lama 2, you know, uh, making it use tools, making it uh, call functions, and, uh, and you can have feedbacks on top of that as well, which is very exciting. So uh, today I was experimenting, what if I gave Lama 2, you know, my personal contacts, like my Slack messages, my, uh, like, uh, my Gmail, and it would be able to uh, take all these actions for me. So I made a very simple uh, Llama, Llama 2 agent that is able to plan and execute. So I think another big problem when it comes to agent is every time you're using a tool, you're making a function call, like that, that can become quite slow when you're, when you're making lots of function calls, because at every step, like that is one call and that can accumulate to a lot. So in this agent, we have a, uh, so here I built a simple planner, which, so we have a, Basically, we have a, we have a very, uh, very long prompt that's able to tell it, okay, so here's some examples. Given a goal, generate a plan in JSON that goes step by step, and for each of the step, you can call inputs from the output of previous steps. So given this plan, this is only one call, you, uh, we can just directly go execute this plan without any, without any more uh, LLM calls, which make things uh, which makes things much faster sometimes, you know, 10 times faster than, than, than a naive agent trying to, trying to call a function every time. And okay, and for the demo, I am gonna try to Actually, close everything, so I have to restart everything. Um, but yes, but yes, the basic idea is that um, yes. Yeah, so, given uh, using this, I was able to get all my two connected to my all, all, like all my personal contact, including like GitHub, Slack, Gmail. It's able to understand all uh, my personal information, and it was able to send send emails and uh, send calendar invites for me. And uh, based on the user confirmation, I was able to collect. Um, like collect my input as well and use that as feedback to, to further train the model, which I think is a very exciting development in, uh, in building general purpose agents with this LLM as, as the backbone and you're able to, you're able to input, uh, it's able to take actions with you and it's able to take your feedback and, and implement all of that as well. Yeah. Couple questions. So um, we can make it more interactive since uh, our projector unfortunately messed up the demo. Um, so on the inputs and outputs, that, to me that's like the part that's missing right now. Like the model is there, obviously. The model two is there. Um, what type of user experience have you built for first ingesting all of that data and making that super easy to do? Uh, maybe you ha haven't focused on that quite yet, but any anything that you built over there, and then also the output. How are you actually going out and executing that? Uh, the outputs. Uh, yes. So in terms of the input user experience, we basically for each of the uh, each of the app, we have like a connector. You would just be able to uh, connect it like a one one click connection, and you would be able to connect to everything and and pull and pull the data from there. And in terms of the output, uh, it, it it's a very nice interface. And before before you execute. Before it takes actions like external actions, like sending emails or sending Slack messages, it asks for confirmation, and then it's able to do that. Um, yeah, we actually have a very nice UI that's able to pop up 
like anywhere on your computer. Um, unfortunately, this is not loading right now. Is it going to be? Is it a Mac app or is it a website? What's the? Yeah. Yeah. So right now, right now it's integrated uh, in the browser. Browser. Yeah. And is website live right now? Can people use it? Uh, I can. I can put it live. Uh, it's on. It's on. It's still on local. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think you can, well, right now to generate robust JSON, uh, I think if you want it to be, want it for like very simple daily tasks, I think this is a very good approach. Actually, even with this, I still have some problems getting Llama 2 to generate uh, reliable JSON. And in the end, I just, I was like, like I added a bunch of things. I was like, make sure your entire output is the JSON and like all caps, and it was not the same. So, um, so what I ended up doing is just I parsed the output. I was like, okay, I look at these brackets, and then I take this as a JSON. And uh, yeah, so there's still still some parsing to be done. So I think uh, for now, for like simple applications, I think uh, if the prompt is long, that's fine, as long as it's reliable and uh, reliable for the model. Uh, oh, so right now I added a parser to parse the output. So I think actually if you generate a prompt in whatever way, it's still, it's still fine because I'm parsing, I'm parsing through that. But yeah, sometimes there's still uh, little trickeries around that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Give yourselves a big round of applause, please. Thank you so much for another incredible act on This is one for the history books. So we're going to give the judges seven minutes <laughs> to do the thing. We'll come back at 10.20. So please come back at 10.20. Thank you. I mean, there's implicit bias, but I don't know what else it would be.